Hello and welcome to Module 4, Unit 2, Policies and Incentives for EV Deployment. I'm Cabell Hodge with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, talking to you as part of this USAID course on EV deployment fundamentals for Southeast Asia, brought to you virtually. I work at NREL primarily as the Federal Fleet Project Leader which means that I provide leadership and direction on federal fleet policy as well as programs. I do some development of analytical tools and models for fleet electrification as well. Uh, and I support international electrification efforts, including some efforts I'm going to talk about in India and Pakistan as part of this presentation. And I've completed a number of fleet electrification techno-economic analyses. Formerly, I worked at the State Colorado Energy Office as a senior transportation policy advisor. And as the name suggests, I was working there heavily on policy, uh, designing and drafting legislative and executive order language for the state. Uh, and I also oversaw several alternative fuel vehicle programs, including a program for charging infrastructure called Charge Ahead Colorado. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the process of developing an electric vehicle plan and call from some examples that we've seen from other countries. So the first step as, this, as part of this plan is to determine your motivation. Uh, so why exactly are you looking at electric vehicles? Is it about manufacturing? Is it about getting um, more efficient vehicles in the hands of your consumers? And then you can figure out what your baseline is and so what your baseline might relate to. And the first case, would be more along the lines of manufacturing, whereas in the second case, you'd probably be looking more at sales of vehicles. And from there, you can set a goal. Then you would need to spend a good amount of time developing a policy roadmap and thinking about the different legislation incentives policies that you can put in place as a country in order to move the needle towards your goal. And then, although this is a straight line, it's really all cyclical. So you'd come back and refine, make sure that everything is fitting with your motivation, um, figure out what your baseline is moving forward, and keep on iterating. So in terms of motivations, I've sketched out a few of the key ones that I've seen. There certainly could be others. The first one, saving consumers money. EVs have lower fuel and maintenance costs, but they do have higher upfront prices. Um, so you need to consider that when thinking about consumer money. Um, and you might want to get at that particular aspect, for example, through upfront incentives, as we've seen in a lot of different countries in U.S. states. Increasing domestic manufacturing is another popular one, uh, and the one that we've seen commonly in Southeast Asia. There are fewer parts in an EV, but the propulsion batteries are more expensive to produce, and there are some transitions that you can make there in order to make sure that you're capturing as much of the value stream as possible. Next up is reducing pollution. Often these focus on greenhouse gases. However, there are a lot of local emissions that can be improved by electric vehicles, things like particulates, uh, carbon monoxide, especially in city centers where uh, where typically the problems stem from a lot of vehicle traffic, things along the lines of ozone, NOx, and SOx. Electric motors are going to be more efficient, but of course the vehicles rely on local electricity generation, and so you would need to look at the upstream emissions as part of this goal. The next motivation is reducing reliance on foreign petroleum. I know that was a primary motivation in early years for the United States. Um, as a country, we were importing a lot of petroleum. We've since increased a lot of our petroleum uh, production through, um, through the shale boom. And many countries, though, do experience energy insecurity due to reliance on crude or even centralized infrastructure like we saw in the southeastern United States uh, with the recent Pipeline Act. Step two is identifying a baseline. So I'm looking at a baseline for a few different countries, including uh, Norway, which is well ahead of the rest of the world. You do see some competition coming from other Northern European countries like the Netherlands. Uh, the United States is a good bit behind Norway. 
And China has also made a lot of progress. Um, you do see some success, right? So judging on the on the right side there in, in South Korea, um, they've actually recently increased the percentage of new car sales. These numbers are all from 2019. So that's what I had most comprehensively from a report that I did with a couple of colleagues, Kamira Kony and Barbara O'Neill. Um, we look as well at a few other countries that I wanted to include in this graphic. Um, and so these were countries in the Southeastern Asia, um, including Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines. We were actually writing this report specifically for the country of Pakistan, which was just then identifying its own goal and trying to figure out which policies were going to be effective for it to meet that goal. Looking at the EV share by major market in 2020, um, you can see a few different metrics are placed here. The three that we look at are the United States, um, Europe, and China. So in the United States, we actually saw a bit of a fall in the EV share in the second half of 2019 and then a bit of stagnation in 2022. It's up slightly to 2.2% of market share in 2020. And actually it's taken off a bit in early 2021. So you can see just how quickly these figures can get outdated. Uh, the first quarter of 2021 has been very good for EVs in the United States. Europe really took off in 2020. The market share grew 44% in 2019, and then it grew another 137% in 2020, up to 1.4 million electric vehicles and a market share of 11%. Um, meanwhile, China stagnated in the second half of 2019 and then returned to growth in 2020. Um, they are the largest or they've actually been passed, it looks like, by Europe uh, in 2020 in terms of being the largest EV market. Uh, they had been for a couple years there, and their market share was 6.3% in 2020. This is just another way of looking at the market share on a completely global basis. Um, so you can see the very light blue is 2018. The next color up is 2019. 2020, the red represents a fall, um, so lowering EV sales, whereas these, this medium blue is an increase in sales. And you can see 2021 is the dark blue and significant increases uh, across the board, January, February, and March. Looking at this in terms of year over year market share, uh, that's jumped up to over 8% um, global sales in March of 2021. Um, really impressive numbers there. Very exciting. Exciting. I want to shift gears and look at the federal fleet a bit in terms of what our current baseline is. So folks may have heard that the U.S. is planning to electrify its federal fleet, and we are starting with a very low baseline. So 0.3% of the federal fleet is battery electric or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, BEVs or PHEVs, meaning full-size vehicles, and another 0.4% is low-speed electric vehicles. These are the different segments that you can see, and they are all fair game for electrification. We also only have 3,000 federal EV charging ports, and you can imagine that number is going to have to grow to something that's substantial enough to support up to 600,000 all electric vehicles. The federal fleet by classification, another way to look at it, about 40,000 vehicles are foreign, meaning that they are not based in the United States, but instead based in other countries. Another approximately 100,000 are either law enforcement or emergency response vehicles. And the remaining 500,000 vehicles approximately are considered domestic covered, which means they are required to comply with statutory directions on the federal fleet. And often that's what we're talking about and focusing on more heavily. 
terms of setting a goal, Pakistan recently set a goal for 50% of their two and three wheeler sales to be electric by 2030 and 90% of those sales to be electric by 2040. They also set a goal for 30% of car sales, so thinking sedans and station wagons by 2030 and 90% by 2040. They also set a goal for 30% of truck sales by 2030 and 90% by 2040. Finally, they set a goal for 50% of bus sales to be electric by 2030 and 90% by 2040. Currently, there are not a lot of electric vehicles in the country of Pakistan. So it's a similar case where you're starting with a low baseline and setting some pretty aggressive goals. The reason they're focused, I think, on these different segments is because you can see how they break down on the right. There are two ways of looking at this. So one is the number of vehicles registered in Pakistan. Um, so most of those are two wheelers. Uh, about 17 million, about 3 million are cars, less than a million are three wheelers, and then if you add up trucks and buses together, that's about half a million. And the number of vehicles produced in Pakistan tracks in a fairly similar way, although the discrepancies are in some ways even larger. Two and three wheelers, about 1.3 million vehicles produced in a year, about 170,000 cars produced in a year. Uh, the tractors, meaning for the tractor trailers, so trucks in a sense, uh, 37,000. Light commercial vehicles, which also might fall under the truck category up above, um, about 19,000. And then you can see there are some Jeeps, some trucks, and some buses, but not in terribly large numbers. The only reason I didn't put these numbers together is because they were classified differently in the report where we were gathering the data. So the federal fleet, as I mentioned, has an aggressive goal. Right now, as of June 2020, the Executive Order 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, is the most significant policy push written down going towards electric vehicles. Section 205 of that executive order requires the federal fleet to develop a comprehensive plan to create good jobs and stimulate clean energy industries by revitalizing the federal government's sustainability efforts. And this actually goes beyond the federal fleets. So it includes the facilities, it includes renewable energy production, and the plan shall aim to use all available procurement authorities to achieve or facilitate clean and zero emission vehicles, so primarily EVs for federal, state, local, and tribal government fleets, including vehicles of the United States Postal Service, which is dealt with in some ways a little differently than the rest of the federal fleet. So now we're on to step four, and this is where I'm gonna focus a lot of the discussion, developing a policy roadmap. And there are quite a few aspects of this that you can consider, and they all really intertwine in this sort of Venn diagram we have here. EV and charger targets is a nice place to start, and really that goes back to setting the goal, but those policies in and of themselves can push manufacturers and can push purchasers uh, and signal the adoption of EVs. But more specifically, the most common incentive and one of the most effective is purchase incentives. Another one that you see a lot is vehicle manufacturing mandates. So pulling upstream on the supplier, whereas the purchase incentives are more of a push downstream to the buyer. Then fossil fuel taxes is a way to disincentivize internal combustion engine vehicles like gasoline or diesel vehicles. Soft cost incentives are another way to push EVs forward. Um, so things like, think of things like preferred parking or in Norway, it's particularly important that they have an exemption for using the ferry. Um, disincentives for conventional vehicle use. Those can be things like fossil fuel taxes. In some cases, those are other sorts of registration type fees um, or other sorts of limitations. And then charger installation. 
Um, so this isn't necessarily an incentive in the same way you would think of a purchase incentive. Rather, it's something that's going to be a little bit more like setting up the infrastructure that's necessary for the market to compete with established fuel types like gasoline. So I wanted to look at a few countries and how they've done in terms of incentivizing electrification. And I want to start with Norway, because if you remember a few slides back, I showed that Norway is already over 50% electrification over in 2019, and they're even further ahead in 2020. So what makes them so successful? In a nutshell, on the right, you can see that the same vehicle, essentially the Volkswagen Golf or the Volkswagen e-Golf is going to be a little bit cheaper after incentives um, to get the electric vehicle version and a little bit more expensive after incentives and taxes to get the gasoline version. So the Golf before taxes is gonna be about 22,000 euros the e-Golf is going to be about 33,000 euros. Then the Golf has to pay a CO2 tax of over 4,000, a NOx tax of $200, a weight tax of 1,700, a scrapping fee of 249 euros, and a value-added tax of 5,500. The e-Golf is exempt from almost all of those taxes except for the scrapping fee. So that's the first point. EVs are cheaper at the point of sale than gas vehicles. But how'd they get there? Well, they exempt EVs from import taxes. They exempt the value added tax and road tax. They also limit the ferry and municipal parking and toll route road fares for electric vehicles. They further reduce the company car taxation, uh, provide EV access to bus lanes, the charging infrastructure is readily available, and they have high incomes in Norway, and so it's a little bit easier for them to turn over vehicles more quickly, um, and they have those high taxes on gasoline vehicles, which gives them room to cut down all of these taxes and make that e-golf more affordable. I want to talk about three electric vehicle markets in China, starting with two wheelers. Two wheelers have long been a great success story in China, and they got there in a different way than all of the incentives and tax exemptions that you saw in Norway. Uh, they got there by designating electric two wheelers as bicycles, as long as they were capped at 20 kilometers per hour, and providing them access to bicycle lanes in urban cores, where gasoline two wheelers were effectively banned. Um, this has been a success story going on about 15 years now with more than 20 million two-wheelers sold each year there uh, and a really high percentage of electrification. Cars in the new energy vehicle policy has been a slightly different story and a much more recent one. So they've achieved up to 6.3% light duty EV sales in 2020 um, by requiring in part automakers to obtain 12% NEV credit. Uh, the math is a little bit interesting there because each electric vehicle may qualify for as many as six NEV credits uh, based on its range, based on its fuel type. So hydrogen fuel cell vehicles qualify for more credit, battery electric vehicles, more credits than plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and then all adjusted by range and a couple of other factors. Um, there was an estimate that the average EV in China qualifies for about three NEV credits, uh, but that's really a give or take kind of thing. Uh, as part of this policy, China's exempted EVs from the 17% value added tax. Uh, so this is more of a tax exemption, more of what you'd see in Norway. Uh, there are also rebates for BEVs and PATVs based, again, in large part on vehicle range. And then there's something that looks a little bit more like the two-wheeler policy, but not quite. And that's a city exemption on their lottery system 
to get a license plate to operate a vehicle. Um, there is also an exemption as part of that on license plate fee, on license plate fees. Buses have been another success story. This one's been sort of local. So in particular, a lot of folks point to electric buses in this city, Shenzhen. 100% uh, of Shenzhen buses are electric, in part because there's 72,000 USD incentive per bus, but also in part because the city itself is really behind it, providing parking for these buses where they can charge, um, working with landowners in that regard, and then really pushing forward in part to support their local manufacturing, including BYD, which is headquartered right in that area. We have a very interesting study on the state level correlation of market variables on per capita EV purchases. It's going to be specific to states in the U.S. Uh, so there are 50 different states in the U.S., each of which has its own sort of policy for electric vehicles. And so we can see a lot of variation on this and we have pretty good data on it, too. So we looked at some, or they looked at some explanatory variables and this table outlines those. Um, so the first one is charging stations, the number of EVSE ports per 100,000 population. So essentially per capita in a sense. The next one is tax credits in dollars. Then we've got rebates, sales tax waiver, High occupancy vehicle lanes, which are vehicle lanes that are typically only available if you have three or more people in an individual vehicle that are sometimes extended to EVs in specific states. Then a home charger credit, a discount for the electricity used at home, and then the price of gasoline. So looking at the charging stations, we saw an increase in purchases overall by 3% on EVs and specifically on early adopters, which isn't really shown in this table. The purchases for PHEVs did not increase by as much as the purchases did for BEVs. And this makes sense because BEVs are going to be more reliant on public charging infrastructure than PHEVs, which can always stop at a gas station. Uh, we didn't really, or they didn't really have a way to look at the number of residential chargers installed, and that's typically a decision that's going to be made at the residences. Then tax credits and dollars. I found this very interesting that the PHEV impact was not considered significant, whereas it increased the acquisition of BEVs by about 5.3%. Uh, rebates were even more effective Again, they couldn't find a statistical significance in that relationship for PHEVs, but for BEVs, found it increased purchases by 7.7%. So you may be asking what the difference is there, and tax credits are income tax credits, or as they're referred to in this paper, which means they aren't received until up to a year after the purchase of a BEV. Uh, the rebate instead is going to typically be taken off right at the time of sale. Sales tax waivers similarly are taken off at the time of sale, but perhaps it's a little bit harder to communicate those or it's just not as obvious as the initial price. And so you see there is again an increase in purchases overall. Um, interestingly, you're still finding it's not very significant for PHEVs, but it's increasing BEV purchases by 5.9%. Now, high occupancy vehicle lane exemption, this seems like a real winner. Um, increasing EV purchases by 8.3%, um, a similar amount for PHEVs and a much higher amount for BEVs. So this is nice on a couple of levels. So one, it's going to cut down on your commute times, but two, it's probably going to reduce your range anxiety if you know that you're not going to be stuck on the highway, but instead can use these less crowded HOV lanes in order to get where you would like to get going. I should have pointed out up above here that when we're talking about the tax credits, rebates, and sales tax waivers, 
that's for each thousand dollars. So if this tax credit was say two thousand dollars, the increase on BEV purchases would be more like two thousand dollars, or would be more like ten percent. And because the federal income tax credit is up to seventy five hundred currently for BEVs. Um, you can see that that's going to be more like 35, 40% increase in BEV purchases. The home EVSC credit, uh, interestingly, this was not deemed significant overall, but they did find for the Chevrolet Volt, it actually was significant and it was pretty large. Um, so I do wonder why that would be. Perhaps it was simply better advertised for the Chevrolet Volt. Then the home charging discount. So this is lowering the price of electricity uh, that folks would need to pay for charging their vehicles. And there are findings that that is not significant in any of those cases. The gasoline price though, we're only looking at a 1% difference here. Whereas we know that gasoline prices swing more like 50 to 100%. And you are seeing an increase in purchases um, fairly significant when you think about it on that scale across the board here. India has taken an interesting approach as well. Um, and part of that is related to their goal. So their goal is not just for the faster adoption of electric vehicles, but also for the faster manufacturing of electric vehicles. And their financial incentive programs are going to favor local production through a requirement for localization of components. They have the highest funding levels for bus electrification. And we actually did some analysis over in the city of Surat. You can see on this map here, these are the Surat bus rapid transit system vehicles. Uh, and we got second by second data so that we could track them and where you could put chargers, uh, how much energy they would need per day, uh, and what power the chargers would need to be at those depots, which are identified by these little call out boxes. It's a little bit of an eye chart there, but just wanted to give you an idea of some of the ways that they're looking at those vehicles. You can see buses are a huge priority. Um, they're gonna have, might be covered up by my face here, but the largest amount of incentives are available for buses through FAME 2, which is the revision to the original FAME program. Um, as of 2019, EV market share did remain low. However, there are a lot of buses that are going to be electric that are gonna be rolling out in several of these large Indian cities over the next few years. The Republic of Korea also favors domestic production. However, they have a bit more of an eye towards the international market. Um, specifically, I know these vehicles are popular in the United States. This is the Kia Nero down below on the left and the Hyundai Kona down on the right. Uh, and South Korea set a goal for vehicle sales of 33% in 2030. They weren't having a lot of luck initially, but then the sales really took off with the release of these two vehicles, the Kia Nero and the Hyundai Kona. Um, and an interesting story that you see across a lot of these countries is domestic models dominating in their local market. In the United States, the large majority of battery electric vehicle sales are from Tesla uh, in China. BYD and BAIC dominate the market. And in Korea, Kia and Hyundai dominate the market. So their policies were not only focused on this purchase subsidy here, see here of 8 million won and a waiver of the 5% excise tax, but also liquidity and loan guarantees to domestic manufacturers. Thailand is also pushing to promote manufacturing and that is their primary objective based on their goals. Um, the roadmap to EV production by 2025 calls for 250,000 electric cars, 3,000 electric buses, and 53,000 electric motors 
motorcycles. Those really pale in comparison to their long-term production goals of 1.2 million EVs annually by 2036 and of 40% market share by 2040. The policies also favor the companies producing these vehicles. Uh, there's a corporate tax exemption for EV factories for eight years, a reduction in import tariffs on machinery, and then raw material privileges. Um, and so Thailand has some raw materials that can be valuable for lithium ion batteries. Indonesia similarly uh, is providing some incentives and is interested in manufacturing. However, they do have a focus on incentives for local EV purchases. Um, they're trying to push for two wheelers to make up 40% of their market by 2023 and 80% by 2026. So quite a bit more aggressive than we were just looking at on the previous slide. Four wheelers, they're looking for 35% by 2021 and 80% by 2030. Uh, nickel and cobalt reserves are key elements in one of the most common EV traction batteries, the nickel manganese cobalt lithium ion battery or the NMC battery that you see in Nissan Leafs and a lot of other popular EVs. Um, Toyota, Hyundai, and GEM have all invested in manufacturing in Indonesia. And in case you're curious, on this slide here, you're looking at a battery stack in NREL's uh, battery laboratory. On the prior side, you were also looking at a NREL EV laboratory. Uh, so just a couple of cool images that I had on hand thought would be good to share here. Vietnam, another interesting strategy. I know I keep saying this, um, but I did find this one to be different. They were trying to capitalize on national pride. So in addition to just reducing the excise tax like we've seen in many other countries, one company, VinFast, put together this vehicle design selection process that incorporated input from 60,000 Vietnam participants. And I think they came up with a pretty slick looking car and hopefully one that's going to do well there. I do think that really is a key aspect of growing local EV markets is producing a vehicle that's going to be popular in your local market. Um, and that may have potential to export as well, like we've seen with Korea and Hyundai and Kia, as well as the US with Tesla. So in summation, I wanted to look at what policies are effective. Um, and we don't have a quantification yet of what policies by country are the most effective in the same way that you saw with that paper from Cowley and S. Horner about uh, policies in the United States. However, it's something that's ripe for the doing. And what we've seen are financial incentives are impactful. Um, it's the most common thing that folks go to and for very good reason. Notice that they're more impactful closer to the point of purchase. The ability to advertise them is important as well. When I was working for the state of Colorado, we had a very complex EV incentive system. So it was a state income tax rebate that was based on the size of your battery um, up to a certain cap. I think it was up to $6,000, but it worked out to your battery size times 150, something along those lines. And folks just didn't really know what it was and dealerships didn't want to communicate it because they were afraid they were going to give people bad advice. They were afraid that people wouldn't qualify for the incentive because they didn't have the tax liability. So we moved it up to the point of purchase. We made it a flat $5,000 in those uh, initial years. It's since ramped down a little bit. Um, and we made it so that you could transfer transfer it to the dealership at the point of purchase. So when I bought my electric vehicle, I just signed over that tax credit and took the $5,000 right off the top of the vehicle. So that I think was an effective way to change how a policy worked using the same amount of money um, from the government coffers. 
There's actually a study from some folks at UC Davis that showed that incentives account for about 50% of the EV market in the United States. Again, it's a little old, maybe four or five years old now. Um, you might see it's a little bit less as EVs approach cost parity, but I think until you get there, you're going to need some sort of financial boost, um, even if it's only nominal. Granting exclusive access to EVs, it's been a hugely impactful policy. So if you recall on the slide where we were looking at that study of US policies, the HOV access increased EV adoption by about, I think it was about 14%. Um, and so that's very significant. And it was really a similar policy in China with the electric two wheelers that pushed them to such great success. I mean, that in that case, that was really an outright ban on the access to the city urban course for the gasoline vehicles. So now you're faced with the choice, a regular bicycle or an electric two wheeler. And in that case, you're gonna see electric two wheelers do pretty well. And maybe it's not the worst thing, especially if your goal is emissions, if you are pushing more people out of gasoline um, motorcycles and onto bicycles. Mandates on automotive manufacturers are a good way to shift the burden to manufacturers and to signal an indication. However, <coughs> on their own, based on a sort of cursory review, they've not appeared to be successful without other incentives and without other buy-in from the manufacturers. What you've seen in the state of California and in the country of China is that when they aren't working, manufacturers push back very hard on the government and they push to extend those mandates out into years when they think they can make them. Or they push for incentives because they wanna see people buying the vehicles, not just because the manufacturers had to make it so cheap um, that they are actually losing money. That's not necessarily a position that you want your manufacturers to be in um, with some resentment and some losses on their EVs. Uh, we were seeing in the US in the initial years, a lot of compliance cars, um, but now you're seeing really a lot of manufacturers simply competing for market share and seeing what's going on in other countries like Norway and hoping for a similar result in our own country. Gasoline prices are a really interesting way to push EVs forward as well. There's a significant correlation between high gas prices and EV adoption in the United States. Um, and I actually worked with a graduate student while I was at the state of Colorado looking at gasoline taxes specifically. Um, and we found that gasoline taxes can and did move the EV market generally as an unintentional byproduct, but in various US states where a gasoline tax had been enacted, there was immediately a big shift towards EVs and we found statistical significance there as well. You would think that electricity rate discounts would have the same sort of impact, um, but they've been found to be less effective than increasing gasoline prices. Um, I mentioned with buses that this may be an easier lever to pull, I think for a couple reasons. So one, consumers might not be as savvy about new special rates for electric vehicles as fleets. Uh, and fleets generally are making decisions based on a total cost of ownership approach. Um, whereas consumers are really focused on those initial costs and might not be looking for the long term. They might just simply know that electricity is cheaper to fuel their vehicle than gasoline, uh, but they're not always gonna be running the numbers to figure that out. Um, if you do move towards gasoline prices um, or increasing gasoline taxes, for the time being where EV adoption is not a huge part of the market in most countries, like it's not more than 50% anywhere except for Norway, um, the lost revenue from gasoline taxes is not going to be that significant. 
but in some of those countries and in some U.S. states, uh, we have had to start exploring replacement fees based on things like vehicle miles traveled. An easy way to do that is at the point of registering the vehicle, so on an annual basis, uh, determining how many miles the vehicle drove that year, and then charging a tax based on that. And that's going to correlate pretty closely to how much those vehicles use the roads, which is really the goal of the road taxes and the gasoline taxes. Charging infrastructure, I mentioned it before, has an outsized impact on early adopters. Um, and it does have a statistical impact on EV adoption. And it's just really a key piece for folks to see in their early years that there is a way to charge their vehicles out there, um, especially when EV penetration is really low. You can have a lot of what's termed range anxiety where people are scared to drive too far in their EVs or they're scared to simply buy an EV because they think they're going to end up in an untenable position. The charging infrastructure requirements to install it in multifamily residential buildings and businesses may be necessary to reach high goals. You see some cool examples in specific cities like Amsterdam, where there's a program set up by the city. So if you purchase an EV, you can inform the city. And if there's not a charger already on your block, they will go ahead and install one. Um, they'll likely install an extra port in case somebody else comes along. But when they find that those chargers are oversubscribed and they can tell by simply how often they are plugged in, uh, they'll come back and they'll install some more. Um, policies favoring domestic manufacturers seem to be impactful as well. Uh, favorable financing or requirements for local production have proven effective in various examples, including a lot in Southeast Asia and Southern Asia like India. Um, domestic EVs dominate many markets, as I noted before. And that's it from me. Um, feel free to reach out to me with questions at cabal.hodge at nrel.gov. I'm putting this on in conjunction with a couple of my colleagues, Sanjini and Isabel, so their emails are listed here as well. Feel free to reach out to any of us and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. I hope this was educational. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day.